welcome to Dweller of the Dark. We are a channel honoring the yellowed and blackened bones of many prominent authors. We will be digging up several obscure, strange, and forgotten authors who influenced many of the great horror, science fiction, and fantasy writers to date. Thousands of more horrifying, obscure, strange, and forgotten tales continue to creep and slither out of the tombs. Subscribe, comment, like, donate, or I'll send the hideous that is forged to steal your cursed soul as we did the like button. To our legion of ghouls and latest horror masters, thank you profoundly for these ghoulish delights. Your pound of writer's flesh kept the hideous wolves on the mountain for now. New unknown horror masters, join if you dare. The Shadow on the Mountain and Trail of the Crimson Claw horror collections just released. You can find them everywhere. A few surprise projects are coming like a horde of zombies. Links and websites in the description below. Children of Horror, Legion of Ghouls, tonight. Let's get into the Christmas spirit of sorts with Ambrose Bierce's haunting tale, Haita the Shepherd. First published for The Wave on January 24, 1891, this tale introduces Haster, the god who is also known as the King in Yellow, though many will recognize him as the half-brother to Cthulhu. Enjoy. Haita the Shepherd by Ambrose Pierce. In the heart of Haita, the illusions of youth had not been supplanted by those of age and experience. His thoughts were pure and pleasant, for his life was simple and his soul devoid of ambition. He rose with the sun and went forth to pray at the shrine of Haster, the god of shepherds, who heard and was pleased. After performance of this pious rite, Haita unbarred the gate of the fold, and with a cheerful mind drove his flock afield, eating his morning meal of curds and oat cake as he went, occasionally pausing to add a few berries cold with dew, or to drink of the waters that came away from the hills to join the stream in the middle of the valley and be born along with it, he knew not whither. During the long summer day, as his sheep cropped the good grass which the gods had made to grow for them, or lay with their forelegs doubled under their breast and chewed the cud, Haita, reclining in the shadow of a tree, or sitting upon a rock, played so sweet music upon his reed pipe that sometimes, from the corner of his eye, he got accidental glimpses of the minor sylvan deities leaning forward out of the copse to hear, but if he looked at them directly, they vanished. From this, he must be thinking if he would not turn into one of his own sheep. He drew the solemn inference that happiness may come if not sought, but if looked for will never be seen. For next to the favor of Hastur, who never disclosed himself, Aita most valued the friendly interest of his neighbors, the shy immortals of the wood and stream. At nightfall, he drove his flock back to the fold, saw that the gate was secure, and retired to his cave for refreshment and for dreams. So passed his life, one day like another, save when the storms uttered the wrath of an offended god. Then Haita cowered in his cave, his face hidden in his hands, and prayed that he alone might be punished for his sins and the world saved from destruction. Sometimes when there was a great rain and the stream came out of its banks, compelling him to urge his terrified flock to the uplands, he interceded for the people in the cities which he had been told lay in the plain beyond the two blue hills forming the gateway of his valley. It is kind of thee, O Hastur, so he prayed, 
to give me mountains so near to my dwelling and my fold that I and my sheep can escape the angry torrents. But the rest of the world thou must thyself deliver in some way that I know not of, why I will no longer worship thee. And Hastur, knowing that Haeta was a youth who kept his word, spared the cities and turned the waters into the sea. So he had lived since he could remember. He could not rightly conceive any other mode of existence. The holy hermit who dwelt at the head of the valley, a full hour's journey away, from whom he had heard the tale of the great cities where dwelt people, poor souls, who had no sheep, gave him no knowledge of that early time when, so he reasoned, he must have been small and helpless like a lamb. It was through thinking on these mysteries and marvels and on that horrible change to silence and decay which he felt sure must sometime come to him as he had seen it come to so many of his flock as it came to all living things except the birds that Haeta first became conscious how miserable and hopeless was his lot. It is necessary, he said, that I know whence and how I came. For how can one perform his duties unless able to judge what they are by the way in which he was entrusted with them? And what contentment can I have when I know not how long it is going to last? Perhaps before another sun I may be changed. And then what will become of the sheep? What indeed? become of me. Pondering these things, Aita became melancholy and morose. He no longer spoke cheerfully to his flock, nor ran with alacrity to the shrine of Hastur. In every breeze he heard whispers of malign deities whose existence he now first observed. Every cloud was a portent signifying disaster, and the darkness was full of terrors. His reed pipe, when applied to his lips, gave out no melody, but a dismal wail. The sylvan and riparian intelligences no longer thronged the thicket side to listen, but fled from the sound, as he knew by the stirred leaves and bent flowers. He relaxed his vigilance, and many of his sheep strayed away into the hills and were lost. Those that remained became lean and ill for lack of good pasturage, for he would not seek it for them, but conducted them day after day to the same spot through mere abstraction, while puzzling about life and death of immortality he knew not. One day, while indulging in the gloomiest reflections, he suddenly sprang from the rock upon which he sat and with a determined gesture of the right hand exclaimed, I will no longer be a suppliant for knowledge which the gods withhold. Let them look to it that they do me no wrong. I will do my duty as best I can, and if I err upon their own heads, be it. Suddenly, as he spoke, a great brightness fell about him, causing him to look upward, thinking the sun had burst through a rift in the clouds, but there were no clouds. No more than an arm's length away stood a beautiful maiden, so beautiful she was that the flowers about her feet folded their petals in despair and bit their heads in token of submission. So sweet her look that the hummingbirds thronged her eyes, thrusting their thirsty bills almost into them, and the wild bees were about her lips. And such was her brightness that the shadows of all objects lay divergent from her feet, turning as she moved. Aita was entranced. Rising, he knelt before her in adoration, and she laid her hand upon his head. Come, she said in a voice that had the music of all the bells of his flock. Come. Thou art not to worship me, 
who am no goddess. But if thou art truthful and dutiful, I will abide with thee. Aita seized her hand, and stammering, his joy and gratitude arose, and hand in hand, they stood and smiled into each other's eyes. He gazed on her with reverence and rapture. He said, I pray thee, lovely maid, tell me thy name, and whence and why thou comest. And this she laid a warning finger on her lip and began to withdraw. Her beauty underwent a visible alteration that made him shudder. He knew not why, for still she was beautiful. The landscape was darkened by a giant shadow sweeping across the valley with the speed of a vulture. In the obscurity, the maiden's figure grew dim and indistinct, and her voice seemed to come from a distance as she said in a tone of sorrowful reproach. Presumptuous and ungrateful youth, must I then so soon leave thee with nothing do but thou must at once break the eternal compact. Inexpressibly grieved, Aita fell upon his knees and implored her to remain, rose and sought her in the deepening darkness, ran in circles calling to her aloud but all in vain. She was no longer visible, but out of the gloom he heard her voice saying, Nay, thou shalt not have me by seeking. Go to thy duty, faithless shepherd, or we shall never meet again. Night had fallen. The wolves were howling in the hills, and the terrified sheep crowding about Aita's feet. In the demands of the hour, he forgot his disappointment, drove his sheep to the fold, and repairing to the place of worship, poured out his heart in gratitude to Haster for permitting him to save his flock, then retired to his cave and slept. When Haeda awoke, the sun was high and shone in at the cave, illuminating it with a great glory. And there, beside him, sat the maiden, she smiled upon him with a smile that seemed the visible music of his pipe of reeds. He dared not speak, fearing to offend her as before, for he knew not what he could venture to say. Because, she said, thou didst thy duty by the flock, and didst not forget to thank Haster for staying the wolves of the night, I am come to thee again. Wilt thou have me for a companion? Who would not have thee forever, replied Haeta. Oh, never again leave me until, until I change and become silent and motionless. Haeta had no word for death. I wish indeed, he continued, that thou wert of my own sex that we might wrestle and run races and so never tire of being together. At these words, the maiden arose and passed out of the cave, and Haeta, springing from his couch of fragrant boughs to overtake and detain her, observed to his astonishment that the rain was falling and the stream in the middle of the valley had come out of its banks. The sheep were bleeding in terror, for the rising waters had invaded their fold, and there was danger for the unknown cities of the distant plain. It was many days before Haeta saw the maiden again. One day he was returning from the head of the valley, where he had gone with ewe's milk and oat cake and berries for the holy hermit, who was too old and feeble to provide himself with food. Poor old man, he said aloud as he trudged along homeward. I will return tomorrow and bury him on my back to my own dwelling where I can care for him. Doubtless it is for this that Hastor has reared me all these many years and gives me health and strength. As he spoke, the maiden, clad in glittering garments, met him in the path with a smile that took away his breath. I am come again, she said. 
to dwell with thee, if thou wilt now have me, for none else will. Thou mayest have learned wisdom, and art willing to take me as I am, nor care to know. Haida threw himself at her feet. Beautiful being, he cried, if thou wilt but deign to accept all the devotion of my heart and soul after Haster be served, it is thine forever. But alas, thou art capricious and wayward. Before tomorrow's sun, I may lose thee again. Promise, I beseech thee, that however in my ignorance I may offend, thou wilt forgive and remain always with me. Scarcely had he finished speaking when a troop of bears came out of the hills, racing toward him with crimson mouths and fiery eyes. The maiden again vanished and he turned and fled for his life. Nor did he stop until he was in the cot of the holy hermit, whence he had set out. Hastily barring the door against the bears, he cast himself upon the ground and wept. My son, said the hermit from his couch of straw, freshly gathered that morning by Hata's hands. It is not like thee to weep for bears. Tell me what sorrow hath befallen thee, that age may minister to the hurts of youth with such balms as it hath of its wisdom. Aeta told him all, how thrice he had met the radiant maid, and thrice she had left him forlorn. He related minutely all that had passed between them, omitting no word of what had been said. When he had ended, the holy hermit was a moment silent then said, My son, I have attended to thy story, and I know the maiden. I have myself seen her, as have many. Know, then, that her name, which she would not even permit thee to inquire, is happiness. Thou saidst the truth to her, that she is capricious, for she imposeth conditions that man cannot fulfill, and delinquency is punished by desertion. She cometh only when unsought, and will not be questioned. One manifestation of curiosity, one sign of doubt, one expression of misgiving, and she is away. How long didst thou have her at any time before she fled? Only a single instant, answered Haita, blushing with shame at the confession. Each time I drove her away in one moment. Unfortunate youth, said the holy hermit, but for thine indiscretion thou mightst have had her for two. <coughs> Thank you for listening, and have a great night. <coughs>